Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Oh, excuse me. I wonder if you'd have the time to take part in some market research. Um, what's it about? About this club and your experiences and opinions about being a member. It'll take less than five minutes. Oh, OK then, as long as it's quick. <laughs> Can I start by taking your name? It's Selina Thompson. Is that T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N? Yes. OK, great. Thanks. And what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an accountant, but I'm between jobs at the moment. I understand. But that's the job I'll put down on the form. And would you mind my asking which age group you fall into? Below 30, 31 to 50 and above? Over 50. <laughs> I think we can safely say. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. And which type of membership do you have? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean how long... Of... No, is it a single-person membership? Oh, right, no, it's a family membership. <laughs> Thanks. And how long have you been a member? Ooh, let me see. Uh, I was certainly here five years ago, and it was probably... Two to three years more than that. Mm -hmm. Shall I put down eight? Oh, I remember now. It's nine, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I've got that. And the last question in this first part is, what brought you to the club? Uh, sorry? Uh, how did you find out about the club? Did you see any ads? Well, uh, I, I did, actually. But I have to say, I wasn't really attracted to the club because of that. It was through word of mouth. So you were recommended by a friend? <laughs> Actually, my doctor. Oh. I'd been suffering from high blood pressure and he said the club was very supportive of people with that condition, so I signed up. Mm, great, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, for the second part of the form, I want to ask a bit more about your experience of the club. Sure. Uh, how often would you say you use the club? <sighs> it varies enormously, depending on how busy I am. Mm, of course. But on average, per month? I'd say it averages out at twice a week. OK, so eight on average. Yeah, and four of those are aqua aerobics classes. That leads me to the next question. Would you say the swimming pool is the facility you make most use of? Fair to say that, yep. Right, thanks. And are there any facilities you don't use? Hmm. One area I realise I've never used is the tennis courts. Mm. And there's one simple reason for that. You don't play tennis? <laughs> Actually, I'm not bad at it. Oh. It's that I'm not happy having to pay extra for that privilege. Oh, right. I've made a note of that. Thanks. Mm. <clears throat> now, in the last section, are there any suggestions or recommendations you have for improvements to the club? Only about health and fitness? Anything at all. Well, I'd like to see more social events. Oh. It isn't just a question of getting together for games or classes, but other things, you know. Yes, yeah, sure. And another thing that I was thinking when I had my yoga class in the gym last night, we were all sweltering in the heat, uh, was that I think they should put in, well, you know... Uh, Air conditioning. Uh, that's exactly what I mean. Mm. The rooms are really light and well-designed, but they do need proper installations. Sure. Well, I've made a note of that. Good. So, is there anything else you'd like to suggest? Uh, about quality of service, for example? Oh, 
everyone's very nice here. They couldn't be more friendly and helpful. Oh, but I tell you what, it's a shame the restaurant isn't open in the evening on Saturday. And Sunday as well, for that matter. Oh. So the club should... Yeah, open it later on those days. OK. Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> all the questions I have. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to two students talking about a presentation on time management. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Mark. What are you doing? Hi, Lucy. Well, I, I'm preparing this seminar on time management. I'm supposed to do a presentation on the topic next week. Ironic, isn't it? I'm probably the worst student when it comes to time management. I don't think you're that bad compared to some other people I know. Do you need some help with it? Yeah. I just don't know where to start, to be honest. When are you doing the presentation? I'm supposed to hand in the draft on Wednesday at 11am. The presentation is scheduled for 10am this Friday. That's not too bad. This gives you the whole weekend to prepare. Let's brainstorm some ideas, shall we? Do you want to get a pen and paper to jot down some thoughts? I think you should start with a broad general statement. For example, I read somewhere that organising time is a skill like learning to drive or tying your shoelaces. Then you could move on to discussing the common problems people have with managing time. That's not a bad idea. One of the common problems is putting things off. Yeah, you could also mention some common signs of this symptom such as last-minute holiday shopping, pulling off visits to the doctors or the dentists. Another problem is relying too much on your memory and not writing things down. Do you mean not keeping a diary or a planner to plan the tasks? That's right. For example, writing down what I need to do in a diary or a planner helps me remember what I need to do and makes me more focused on the tasks for the day. Good idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. That reminds me of something I've been meaning to do for a while now. Anyway, I should also include some advice on how to deal with the problem, shouldn't I? Sure, you can talk about some ways of stopping procrastination. I guess making a to-do list can help one focus on what needs to be done. Definitely. Another way to deal with the problem is to prioritise and do the hardest job first, the one which requires the most effort and concentration. Also, my tutor recommended that I should break big projects into small parts with a specific goal. 
Having an action plan has worked for me. I usually make a list of small tasks I need to do to achieve a goal. Sometimes I just don't feel like getting down to work because a task seems too overwhelming for me to even think about. This technique helps me reduce psychological pressure. If I think of a project as a set of easily achievable tasks, don't you think? I know what you mean. I often feel like that myself with the statistics project I've been doing this term. I'm well behind, and the deadline is next week. I think setting deadlines and sticking to them can help one to achieve goals. You can discuss this aspect in your presentation too. A good point. Setting deadlines can also help one become more realistic about the time it takes to do tasks. Another point you could include is how to deal with interruptions. Okay, I guess blocking in time to handle unpredictable interruptions can help one stay focused. Not just that, some interruptions. Such as phone calls can be easily avoided by using answering machines, for example. Saying no, which is one of the most useful words in English, is also very effective. It can be tough sometimes, but you've got to learn to say it nicely but firmly. I think you've got enough ideas here to start with. Definitely. Thanks a lot for your help. I just need to type the ideas up, and I think I'm all set. Do you think you can lend me your laptop for a couple of hours? Mm, I'm afraid I can't. I've got to finish my own project. Never mind. I'll use one at the library. You certainly know how to say no. <laughs> Learned it the hard way. Got to go now. Good luck with the presentation. Cheers. See you later. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear Peter Walsh being interviewed for a job. Listen and choose the correct answer for each question. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Joanne! Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So, I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin, and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So, tell me about it. Well... Where shall I start? Well, Darwin's in what they call the top end, because it's right up at the northern end of Australia, and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists, People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that, we've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia. Probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realize until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. 
the average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art, music, dancing, and so on are concerned, because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theater and opera in the same way as cities down in the south, like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves. Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artist groups and writers groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international. Yeah. They say there are over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but mm, when a very bad storm, uh, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions, but after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious center today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see the places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year, it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles, too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And answer the questions. Please sit down, Mr. Walsh. My name's Jane Swain, and I'm the personnel manager. Hello, how do you do? Now, this is just a short preliminary interview. I'd like to chat about your present job and what you've done up till now. Yes, of course. Well, could you tell me how long you've had your present position in Weston's? It is Weston's, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, I am not sure. Let's see. I left university in 2005. Is that right? Yes, 2005. Then I was unemployed for about three months. And then I traveled round America for a few months. So, yes... It must be about three years now, in fact. Hmm, yes. And have you any particular reason for wanting to change jobs? I mean, why do you want to move? Well, I actually like my present job and still find it interesting and stimulating. The salary's okay, so it's nothing to do with money, though you can always do with more. I suppose the thing is that I'm really very ambitious and keen to get promoted so that's the real reason. You say you like your job. Can you tell me what aspect you like most? Oh, my dear, that's difficult. There are so many things. The other people are great. There's a good cooperative atmosphere. I mean, among the staff, and compared to other companies, the conditions are great. 
I mean the office itself and the working conditions. Hmm. And then there's the fact that they give me lots of room for initiative and let me make decisions. You know, that's what I really like most about the job. Yes, well, we're looking for someone like that. You know, someone who isn't a clock watcher and who isn't too concerned about working fairly long hours. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm used to it. And what about your education? You went to Manchester University, didn't you? Uh, yes. After leaving school, I started a diploma course in design, but I decided to give it up and did an arts degree at university instead. Good. And have you done any courses since? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus rex, or T-Rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum, and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact. Almost every one of those T-Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have 20 sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one-fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands, and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realize an obvious fact. Fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes. But it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. So, Given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria. One, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilized. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft fleshy features that most interest us. 
An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilise, and from the skeleton alone, we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilization is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilized and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the Earth for a long time, and the longer, the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily. And being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history over 250 million years in fact, one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes and they lived in the sea. Perfect. These creatures meet all the criteria and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, Let's think about T. rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time, although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.